If you have your copy of God's Word, and I trust that you do, go ahead and take it and turn with me to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 18. Revelation chapter 18. There are many times in life when one event can cause two completely different reactions. You need to look no further than our hangouts on Sunday afternoon. Uh, On the Lord's Day, we just open up our home. We just enjoy being with our church family so much that we don't want it to end here. So we go home. We have a lot of people over at our house. And inevitably, someone will come into our home with a bag of chipotle, a bowl, and I will rejoice, and all of heaven rejoices as well. And I'll say, that's amazing. And then somebody will say, yeah, that's not real Mexican food, which I know it's not. I know it's not, but it's still good nonetheless. Or we start playing a card game, and somebody will say, this, I just learned this new card game. It's my favorite game. And it's happened before where they break out the box, they start passing out the cards, and then by the time we get to the end of the game, somebody says, I hate that game. That's the dumbest game I've ever played. Somebody wins said card game, and they're ecstatic, and all the losers are not. Sometimes we watch football games together, and while we're watching the 49ers win, all of heaven is rejoicing. Meanwhile, Tori and Adonis, my NFC West rivals, are mourning because they're bad teams. I say that facetiously. We're in last place. Um, One event, two different responses, two different reactions. What about if it's something pertaining to morality? What about if we're staring at something that the world says is beautiful, lovely, and the Bible says is absolutely abhorrent to the Lord? We see that in Romans chapter 1, right? We see the world calling evil good, even though the Bible says that that evil is bad. We see different reactions to the one event. How do our reactions, as we look at the events in history behind us and the future that is yet to come, how do our reactions to a specific event betray where our allegiances lie? That's the question before us this morning. And I believe in chapter 18, we are going to see two very different responses to the same event. And the question that I believe chapter 18 would ask our hearts this morning is, what would your response be? What will your response be? So let's read all of chapter 18. I want to read all of it. I want to remind us of where where we were last week in verses 1 through 8. So we'll read it together, and then we'll read just finishing out the rest of the chapter. Revelation chapter 18, John writes, After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, The earth was illumined with his glory, and he cried out with a mighty voice, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place of demons, and a a prison of every unclean spirit, and a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the passion of her immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality." I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not participate in her sins and receive of her plagues, for her sins have piled up as high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. So pay her back, even as she has paid, and give back to her double according to her deeds, and the cup which she has mixed, mix twice as much for her. To the degree that she glorified herself and lived sensuously, to the same degree give her torment and mourning, because she says in her heart, I sit as a queen, and I am not a widow, and I will never see mourning. For this reason, in one day her plagues will come, pestilence and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire, because the Lord God who judges her is strong. And the kings of the earth, who committed acts of immorality and lived sensuously with her, will weep and lament over her when they see the smoke of her burning, standing at a distance because of the fear of her torment, saying, Woe, woe, the great city Babylon, the strong city, because in just one hour your judgment has come. And the merchants of the earth weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore, cargoes of gold and silver and precious stones and pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet, every kind of citron wood and every article of ivory and every article made from very costly wood and bronze and iron and marble, 
and cinnamon and spice and incense and perfume and frankincense and wine and olive oil and fine flour and wheat and cattle and sheep and cargoes of horses and chariots and slaves and human lives. The fruit that you long for has gone from you. And all things that were luxurious and splendid have passed away from you and men will no longer find them. The merchants of these things who have become rich from her will stand at a distance because of the fear of her torment, weeping and mourning, saying, Whoa, whoa, the great city, she who is clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, because in just one hour, such great wealth has been laid waste. And every shipmaster and every passenger and sailor And as many as make their living by the sea stood at a distance and were crying out as they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, what city is like the great city? And they threw dust on their heads and were crying out, weeping and mourning, saying, woe, woe, the great city in which all who had ships at sea became rich by her wealth, because in just one hour she's been laid waste. Rejoice over her, O heaven. And you saints and apostles and prophets, because God has pronounced judgment for you against her. Then a strong angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence and will not be found any longer. The sound of harpists and musicians and flute players and trumpeters will not be heard in her any longer. No craftsman of any craft will be found in you any longer. The sound of a mill will not be heard in you any longer. The light of a lamp will not shine in you any longer. The voice of the bridegroom and the bride will not be heard in you any longer because your merchants were the great men of the earth, because all the nations were deceived by your sorcery. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all who have been slain on the earth. This is the word of God. Let's go before him and ask his blessing on our time together. Father, we come to the end of chapter 18 as we have been studying through this precious book. Last week, we were absolutely decimated by the beginning of this chapter, seeing our own discontented hearts, desiring materialistic things. And yet again, this morning, we're confronted with the reality of materialism, the reality of discontent, the reality of a longing and an adoring for those things. And yet deeper still, this passage takes us not just to what we have, but what we long for, to the affection level as your word always does. Father, I pray that you would give us eyes to see, that you would give us hearts to receive, give us ears to hear. We are broken vessels We need help. We are completely dependent upon you. Even this sermon, it it will be absolutely pointless if you don't do the work of helping us, of bringing us aid, of applying the truths to our hearts. God, I just, I pray. We, we, We bank our eternal destiny on the words of Isaiah that your word does not return void. So as it goes forth, This morning, we know that you will accomplish something. We come humbly for you to do that work. We come needy. We come as poor beggars and we come excited. Come excited to hear from the God of the universe. You have graciously revealed yourself to us. So we listen. We say with Samuel, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. We want to hear. So Holy Spirit, as we pray every Lord's Day, open our eyes right now that we would behold wonderful things from your law. Turn our hearts to Christ. We pray it in his name. Amen. There are two main reactions, as I said earlier, to this one event of the destruction of Babylon. There is weeping and there is rejoicing. There is mourning over the loss and there is a rejoicing over the destruction. So let's look first at the, uh, the weeping. We'll call it the revealing lamentation. This is verses 9 through 19, a revealing lamentation. This mourning, this weeping reveals something about the hearts of those who are mourning. 
verse 9 begins with the kings of the earth weeping and mourning over the loss of Babylon, over the destruction of not only this uh, religious system, but more specifically this economic system. We, we studied chapter 17 that really had to do more with the religious side of Babylon, and now we're looking at this this future economic system. This, by the way, chapter 18 along with chapter 13 is where we would get this idea of a one world economy. This one world economy in the end times, in the 70th week of Daniel, in those seven years at the very, very end of human history. And here we see three sets of mourners. We see three groups of people weeping. The first group are the leaders and the kings of the earth, the political rulers, the political power brokers of the world. Verse 9, the kings of the earth who committed acts of immorality and lived sensually, sensuously with her. So that's, they were buying into this economic system. She is that harlot and they were doing whatever it took necessary in order to get wealthy off of her, to gain power through her. And now they will weep and lament over her. Weep, that word is a word for loud, extravagant crying, wailing, unable to be consoled. It's interesting to note that by the end of chapter 17, when the religious system is torn down and destroyed, no one sheds a tear. But here they start weeping in an inconsolable way when they see all of their money and power is gone. They were fine with false religion being destroyed. They are not okay with losing their power, their prestige, and their pocketbooks. What they love the most, they are losing. And so they weep. They weep also because they lose it so quickly, so instantly. In just one hour, verse 10 says, in one single hour, your judgment has come. In one single hour. You remember back in verse 8, God says that for this reason, in one day, her plagues will come. Her destruction will come. So in just one day, and that's not a literal day, but that's a short period of time. Here, the kings of the earth will narrow it down. These three sets of mourners will narrow it down. Not one day, but actually just one hour it's such a quick span of time that everything has been taken from them. They see the smoke of her burning. They weep and lament back in verse 9 when they see the smoke of her burning. Those words, that phrase, smoke of her burning, is identical to the phrase that's used in Genesis when Sodom and Gomorrah are destroyed. God destroys Sodom and Gomorrah and the smoke of their burning is rising up to heaven. So too God will destroy Babylon and the smoke of her burning is rising up to heaven. That tells us something very important. You might look at Sodom and Gomorrah and you might see uh, the lifestyle of homosexuality and sexual immorality and say, well, of course that's going to be destroyed. But here, Babylon is not known for their sexual immorality. Babylon is known for their materialism, their discontentedness with the things of this world and longing for more. So that tells us that if they're being destroyed in the exact same way, that in God's eyes, materialism is just as dangerous as sexual immorality. It's just as detested by God. Verse 10, they're standing at a distance and they say, whoa, whoa, cursed. We must be cursed. The illusion was that Babylon could defy God, martyr his saints and get away with it. But now that illusion has been completely destroyed. And so they weep. The second group of mourners is found in verse 11. And they are the merchants of the earth. Those who are selling, buying and selling in Babylon, using Babylon to get rich. So we have people that are powerful over Babylon. Then we have people in Babylon that are using Babylon to get rich. The industrial exporters and businessmen. They're weeping. The merchants of the earth weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. Again, weep and mourn. It's in the tense that means continually ongoing. It cannot be stopped. They're distraught over her destruction. Because with the destruction of Babylon, they've lost their biggest customer. Their most profitable market is gone. The shipping trade's been completely crippled. This is, by the way, the irony of sin. No one buys their cargoes anymore and they're weeping. The complaint of these merchants is that no one's buying their merchandise, which is totally ironic. And this is the irony of sin because they belonged to a system that denied the right to buy or sell to anyone who refused to accept the mark of the beast. So they said, you're not allowed to buy or sell anything. Go away from us. In fact, we're going to kill you. 
Now they themselves are denied the right to buy and to sell. What they were longing for, they end up losing altogether. No one buys their cargo. And there's a list. There's a long list of their cargo. It's 29 separate items that John gives us a description of, and they can be categorized into six different groups. They are not able to buy and sell precious metals and gems. That's group number one. Fabrics for expensive clothing. That's group number two. Ornamental pieces. That's group number three. Aromatic substances, that's group number four. Food, that's group number five. And last, but definitely not least, is animals and human, group number six. Cattle, sheep, cargoes of horses and chariots and slaves and human lives. In the structure of the Greek, the word slave is actually grouped together with the words horses and cattle. Babylon regards human life as cattle. Babylon will stop at nothing to get rich, even if it means dehumanizing people altogether. The way that the ancients used to speak of slaves is that they were just talking tools. And slavery did not end with William Wilberforce in England. It didn't end with the civil rights movement in America. It is still alive and well in our day today. And that's why Babylon will ultimately be destroyed by God for the way that they dehumanize people made in God's image. These are all contemporary symbols. All of the other groupings are contemporary symbols of a lavish, extravagant lifestyle. And so the merchants weep and wail because they have lost their ability to trade. Verse 15, the merchants of these things who became rich from her will stand at a distance because of the fear of her torment, weeping and mourning, saying, Whoa, whoa, the great city, she was clothed in fine linen. She, she looked beautiful. She looked extravagant, the purple and scarlet adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, because in just one hour, such great wealth has been laid waste. Third category, we have the political rulers, we have the merchants, and then we have shipmasters. Shipmasters who use the merchants to get rich. Shipmasters and seafarers. This is in verse 17, the very end of verse 17 or the middle of verse 17. Every shipmaster and every passenger and every sailor and as many as made their living by the sea stood at a distance. The way that all the items that the merchants had were bought and sold was through merchant vessels by way of the sea. So verse 17 says, everyone who made their trade by the sea is going to look and weep and mourn. Verse 18, they're crying out as they see the smoke of her burning, saying, what city is like the great city? Those words, that phrase, what city is like the great city, is identical uh, to Ezekiel's prophecy about Tyre's destruction. God is, is just knocking down the strongholds of, of human discontentment where they cling to greed, they cling to a passion for anything other than God. And so these third, this third group mourns, weeps. They throw dust, verse 19, on their heads. They're crying out, weeping and mourning, saying, Woe, woe, the great city in which all who had ships at sea became rich by her wealth, because in just one hour she's been laid to waste. Three different groups of mourners lamenting. And I said it's a revealing lamentation. So here's my question. What do these three groups of lamenters, what do these three groups of mourners, what does their weeping, their mourning, what does it reveal about what's going on in their hearts? What does it reveal about a world system, a, a materialistic system? Here's what it reveals. All of their mourning is self-interested. All of their mourning is self-interested. No one of these three mourning groups reaches out a hand to help they just stand far off and watch. Therefore, it's a lament of pain and loss. It's not a lament of repentance. They don't care about Babylon at all. They just mourn the loss that they themselves are suffering. Babylon can go away as long as they can get rich somewhere else, but they can't get rich somewhere else, so they're mourning. They're gazing at Babylon just like Mrs. Lot gazed at Sodom and Gomorrah. You remember, she turned back, not in repentance, but in looking and longing and wishing and hoping for what might have been. I think that 
these three groups of mourners just instantly confront us? What is our repentance like? When we look at our own materialistic hearts, our our hearts that long for the things of this world, as we studied last week, as we were confronted and challenged last week, what is our repentance like? How do we view worldliness and materialism? The world is so powerfully alluring and we might be tempted to think as we look at the world getting rich, as we look at the economic system just getting rich and powerful, we might be tempted to think, what do we need to do to get just a piece of it? Just a piece of it. But here's what this passage tells me. This passage teaches that the world's love is always self-interested. If you think, I I just need to be involved in the world just for a tiny little bit, the world will love me, I'll grab a little piece of it, and then I'll be able to disconnect myself from it. The world's love is always self-interested. Its only motive in giving you what you want is to keep you giving to it. It's completely self-interested. That's why these people are so saddened by Babylon's destruction, but they have no desire to help save it. As long as you produce, as long as you perform, as long as you provide, the world will love you. But the moment you cease to do these things, the world will spit you out and destroy you without any care whatsoever. And you might be tempted to think, well, I I can grab a piece of the world. I can be greedy. I can be materialistic. I can grab just a piece and I'll be the exception to the rule. You won't. Worldliness is that tractor beam that sucks us in and will not let us go. This is how the world loves. It's self-interested. This is not how our Savior loves. God's love is not reserved for those who earn it, for those who perform, for those who produce or provide. If that were the case, then none of us would have the slightest hope whatsoever of being loved by God most famous verse in the Bible, God so loved the world that he gave, he gave, his love is self-sacrificing. Listen to the words of self-sacrificing love in Romans chapter 5. At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. He gave of himself because he loves us. So we see a revealing lamentation by these three groups of lamenters, these three groups of mourners, And I believe that they would say to us this morning that we must shatter any idol in our hearts of materialism. Shatter it into a thousand pieces and meet the God who loves you like no one else can love you. Don't be stuck on self-interested love. Cling to self-sacrificial love. And the text doesn't end there, though. We see not only the mourners for Babylon's destruction, we also see people rejoicing over Babylon's destruction. And this is point number two in our outline this morning. Not only do we see the revealing lamentation, but we also see, number two, an exhortation to rejoice. It's a command to rejoice. This is verse 20 all the way through the end of the chapter. Rejoice over her. That's a command. Do it now. Rejoice over her, O heavens. And you saints and apostles and prophets rejoice. Now, we don't know exactly who this command is coming from. It could be an angel, as we've seen an angel giving commands earlier. It could be Jesus. It could be the Father. It it could also be John himself, the apostle, saying as he's watching the destruction of this materialistic system, he might be saying, this is reason to rejoice. We don't know who's giving it, but we do know who it's being given to. It's being given to all of God's people in heaven and all of God's people on earth. Rejoice all God's people, whether in heaven or on earth. And by the way, chapter 19, as we'll get to uh, next week, Lord willing, opens with heaven's response to this invitation. We will see all of heaven saying, yes, we will rejoice. And they sing a fourfold hallelujah chorus. But this exhortation is given to you and to me today. Rejoice over the destruction of this worldly system. It's a command. Rejoice over destruction. Rejoice over wrath and judgment being given. You might be sitting here this morning and you might say, well, I am too compassionate to rejoice at someone else's suffering, at someone else's judgment, at someone else receiving wrath. I'm too compassionate to rejoice at that. And I would just plead with you, be careful of being more compassionate than God himself. God commands us to rejoice, and there's reason to rejoice here in the text. Why are we called to rejoice? In verse 20, 
because God has pronounced judgment for you against her. God has pronounced judgment for you against her. Your translations might say something a little bit different. That's a very clunky verse, right? No one speaks that way. There's, what is it even saying? It's a very hard sentence in English to understand. It's a very hard sentence in Greek to understand. That's why it's clunky in the English. God has given judgment for you against her. What does that mean? It really could only mean two things, one of two things. Either God has done what you thought was right. What you thought was righteous, God did it. You were waiting. What you thought he was going to do, he did it. He pronounced a sentence of judgment in your favor and decided a case in your favor. It could mean that. I don't think that it means that according to some of the words and the way that it, the, the sentence is structured. The, the second meaning that it could have, and I think this is probably the way that it's supposed to be understood, is that God has imposed on Babylon the same sentence that she imposed on you. God has taken the judgment that she gave to you and flipped it around and given it to her. As she attempted to judge you with that judgment, she will be judged. Uh, one translation says it this way, and I think it's very helpful. God has pronounced on her the judgment that she passed on you. This is built on a very important law in the Old Testament regarding the bearing of a false witness. If I were to take you to court on the basis of some lie about you that I have purported, and you receive judgment based on the lie that I said, and then I was found out to be lying, the judgment that was given to you would be given to me. That's what's being said here. Babylon had repeatedly judged Christians and had shed their blood. But now the case has come to the final court of appeals, to the very bar of God himself, and he's overturning Babylon's verdict and giving her the judgment that she gave to you. That's what verse 20 is saying. That's why we rejoice. Wrong has been made right. We said this a few weeks ago that all of those upside down moments in life will be made right side up one day. And then to illustrate the, the finality of Babylon's judgment, verse 21, a strong angel acts out an illustration of this destruction. This is similar to the prophets in the Old Testament who would do symbolic gestures. You remember some of those really strange things that they would do in order to act out the prophecies that they were giving. That's what's happening here. This angel, this strong angel is going to act out the prophecy that's being given of Babylon's destruction. He takes up a, a great millstone, a stone that's like a great millstone and throws it into the sea. That word for throw isn't just lob or toss. Literally could be translated hurled or whizzing past your ear as it goes by, making a sound because it's going so fast. It just instantly took me back to Youth group days, summer camp days. You guys ever use those water balloon launchers? Did you ever use those? There would be this enormous slingshot and two people would stand holding their arms outstretched, locking their elbows. And then somebody would pull back with a little water balloon in this little, uh, little patch. They'd pull back and, and they'd let it go. And if you were standing as one of those two people, did anybody do this or is this just me? As you were standing as one of those pe two people, you were just afraid for your life as that thing went right by your ear. You could hear it go by. That's what's happening here. This angel is hurling this stone with such ferocity and speed that it makes a whizzing sound as it goes by John's ear, as it were. Violently hurling it into the sea. It's not accidental, it's intentional. It's like a millstone. A millstone is four to five feet in diameter. It's one foot thick. It weighs a thousand pounds. It's the stone that was used to crush grapes or, or olives, to produce olive oil, to produce uh, grape juice or wine. It's an enormously heavy stone. So the whole idea here is as it's being thrown into the sea, it's going to instantly sink and all the ripples will one day go away, will soon go away. And that's why the angel says, so will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence and will not be found any longer. There's no way Babylon rises out of this, right? There's no way that that millstone comes back up to the surface. There's no way Babylon gets out of this. It will sink beneath the surface as if it never existed. If you didn't see it going into the water, you wouldn't even know it was there. That's what's happening here. This is 
Babylon's destruction, the finality of her destruction. And then to further compound this destruction, verse 22 and following, we find so many aspects of Babylon's destruction being specified. The sound of harpists and musicians and flute players and trumpeters will not be heard in you any longer. No craftsman of any craft will be found in you any longer. The sound of a mill will not be heard in you any longer. The light of a lamp will not shine in you any longer. The voice of the bridegroom and the bride will not be heard in you any longer. The sound of, of joy and merriment. No more life. It's all gone. All gone. Seven times that phrase, found in you any longer, is used. And in Greek, it's in the double negative. So you could say it this way, no more at all. There is no possibility at all. Not found in you any longer at all ever again. Seven times. We know seven is a number of perfection, completion. This is the complete destruction of Babylon. It was predicted in the Old Testament in Isaiah 13 through 14 and Jeremiah 50 through 51. And here it's finally happening. And it's very interesting because if you go back to verse 7, Babylon said, I will never not see morning. Never not. Again, double negative that she uses. It's not possible for me to ever see morning. And now we see at the end of chapter 18, it's not possible for her ever to rise again out of the morning and destruction that she's in. Why? Why is she being destroyed? Again, I love God's word because as you ask the question, it's answered. Because, middle of verse 23, your merchants were the great men of the earth. You are being destroyed because your merchants were the great men of the earth. Why is that an issue? It's not because of their possession of wealth. It's because of their glorying in their wealth. They loved their wealth. They gloried in their wealth. And they made themselves the center of their universe. This reminds us of, of things that we talked about even last week. Materialism is global. It's always possible to be involved in materialism. This entire worldly economic system is a global and it's going to be destroyed. Materialism is also temporal. Materialism is temporal because God in his glory, is going to destroy this economic system and take away their materialism. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't work hard to make a living, to get money. And that's not what this is saying. Materialism itself is wrong. Money itself isn't wrong. Money is a gift. Money is a tool. Loving money and desiring to get rich and desiring to be filled with greed is where uh, the problem lies. We looked at that last week, and I think that that's an important challenge for our hearts again this morning. So, you are destroyed, Babylon, because your merchants were the great men of the earth. They, they gloried in their materialism. Secondly, because all the nations were deceived by your sorcery. End of verse 23. You are destroyed because all the nations were deceived by your sorcery. All the nations were allured by your promise of wealth and your promise of greed, and they would do whatever it took to be involved in it. That word for sorcery, you might, your translation might be a little bit different. That word for sorcery, the Greek word is the word pharmaceos, where we get pharmaceuticals. Uh, it's literally a, a drug that you, you take and it kind of puts you under a spell. That's the idea here, that you are so caught under the spell of greed and materialism, which again, it teaches us the danger of wealth, the danger of riches. Materialism is a spiritual issue. And everyone in the world at that time who has not, or who has taken that mark of the beast is involved in the spell. They're stuck under it. And that's why she's going to be destroyed. You brought people down with you to destruction. We're not exempt from this. We're not exempt from this. The materialism that we talked about last week, that we see even here this week, this materialism is about us. None of us are exempt from a desire for wealth and riches. Don't think this morning of your neighbor with the nice car and say, well, they, they should be here listening to the sermon. You need to think about you. You need to think about where is materialism grabbing on and the sorcery and the allurement of wealth and riches and, and captivating my affections. Demas, you remember a, a follower of Christ, a follower of the Apostle Paul, helping Paul even in missionary journeys. Paul says that he left the faith because he was in love with this present world. He was in love with this present world. How about you? 
Are you caught under the allurement of materialism? It's a question of who are you going to serve, right? Jesus himself said you can't serve two masters. You either love the one and despise the other. You're devoted to one you hate the other. You can't serve God in money. You can't serve God in anything. And it's always a question of what you love. Do you love money? Do you love what money can give you? And if you do, you can't live for Jesus. Or do you love Jesus? Do you love who he is and all that he promises to be for you in the scriptures? And if so, then you can't live for money and you can't love it. So this morning, again, we're confronted with the reality of our own materialistic affections. How discontented are we? And, And this is why I think God in his kindness has brought this up to our church at this time to help us just go back into our hearts and to say, how are we really doing it with our contentment? How are we really doing with our affections? And hopefully, Lord willing, this isn't the one time of the year that we're going to look inside and say, hey, are we struggling with materialism? Are we struggling with greed? We have to keep on going into our hearts and weeding out any root of greediness. It's like literal weeding. You have to keep on weeding your garden because the weeds just keep coming back and back and back. How often do you need to weed in order to get the weeds out? It can't be once a year. I tried that, by the way, as many of you have seen at my house. Once a year, it doesn't work. No, you have to do it consistently. And therefore, even when it comes to materialism and greed, you might think, man, I I don't have much. I'm not greedy. I'm not materialistic. You have to keep on weeding. Keep on going down into your soul and weeding out any root of greed. Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21 tells us not to lay up for ourselves treasures on earth that are temporal and will go away. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Because in contrast to the transitory wealth that we see in Babylon and the glory of this world that goes away, we have riches forevermore and pleasures forevermore at God's right hand. So Babylon will be destroyed. Number one, because of the merchants being great men, glorying in their wealth, their riches. Number two, because all of the nations were deceived by the sorcery of Babylon. And then finally, number three, in verse 24, the third reason for why Babylon is being destroyed is in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all who had been slain on the earth. I was reading this text this week and just meditating And just thinking through John, I I always love to picture John sitting, writing. Many people have a wrong understanding of inspiration, the doctrine of inspiration, that God's word is inspired. Uh, Second Peter chapter one tells us what that was like. A lot of people think it was this robotic trance, right? That as John's about to write God's word, he's just hanging out being John. And then all of a sudden, like his eyes roll back and he just kind of goes into a trance and start, starts writing. And then all of a sudden his eyes roll back and he's able to see and he goes, hey, I just wrote the Bible. How cool. That's not the doctrine of inspiration. The doctrine of inspiration is that men were moved along or carried along by the Holy Spirit so that what they wrote was not robotically transmitted, It was transmitted through their personality, through their character, through their loves and their affections. You see this even in the way things are written. Paul writes very differently than Peter writes. Luke obviously is going to write differently than Peter because Luke is a trained physician, whereas Peter is just a fisherman. So you're going to see the the beauty of personality live itself out in these books. It's God's word given to us through human agents. Verse 24 You have John writing what God is telling him to write, what God is moving him to write through this vision. And he says that in Babylon, the blood of prophets and of saints and of all who have been slain on the earth is found. And I just, in my sanctified imagination, I just see John dropping the quill and weeping because his brothers counted and the number of martyrs that are here identified. You remember his brother, right? This is John, and John's brothers, James, are the the sons of thunder, the sons of Zebedee. James had his head cut off by Agrippa I in Acts chapter 12. And all of Jerusalem, who was not saved, rejoiced over John's brother being killed. 
That's why I think that John, as he's writing, Babylon will be destroyed because of what Babylon has done to God's people. I think he remembers his brother. I think he thinks of his brother. Oh, James, your death was noticed by God. How many brothers and sisters do we have around the world that are fearful today, the Lord's day, because they don't know as they worship God, they don't know if this is the last day that they have because they don't know if this day is the day of their martyrdom. This is not hypothetical to John. He knows the pain of losing his brother to martyrdom. And this is why all of heaven is readying themselves, as we'll see in chapter 19, to come back with Jesus to avenge the wrong that's been done. To put it in perspective, I've never been in the armed forces. Um, I greatly respect people that are, some in our church. Uh, I wanted to. Got kicked out for a number of reasons. Things wouldn't work out health-wise for me. But I imagine that it's incredibly difficult to fight. I'm, I imagine it's incredibly difficult to kill if you don't know exactly why you're there. If you don't know exactly the reason, if you don't have a solid foundation or a solid motivation for why you are bringing destruction to another people group. But to me, it seems that, let's go back to World War II, seems that if there was any ambiguity in the mind of U.S. soldiers in World War II, any ambiguity about invading Europe, is that right? Should we have done that? Regarding the war in general, why are we here? Why are we spending human life and destroying others? I can only assume that any question mark about why they were doing what they were doing was instantly gone when they came to those barbed wire gates at Auschwitz. When they came to those ovens at Treblinka. I imagine when they saw those, they realized this is why we fight. This is why we fight. Suddenly the rightness of war becomes entirely self-evident. And brothers and sisters, chapter 18 is World War II magnified by a million times. This is, this is the destruction of God's people and an attempt to destroy God's glory. And so the rightness of his judgment is manifestly self-evident as we come to the end of this chapter. It takes us all the way back to Cain and to Abel. The entire Earth is a giant altar on which the blood of God's people have been poured, and God has seen and heard every one, every soul that has been destroyed, every life that has been taken for the gospel. God keeps record of. As we said last week, you don't mess with the apple of God's eye and live to talk about it. That's why in chapter 6 of Revelation, the martyrs are crying out, how long, O Lord, until you avenge? Not, we are angry with our oppressors and we don't like them and we want them to die. That's not what the issue here, here is. The issue here is, is evil going to win? God, you promise safety and protection for your people and it doesn't look like you're offering any of that. It doesn't look like you're making good on your promises. And so here... We're confronted with the reality yet again that God may not pay at the end of every day, but at the end, he pays. Whoever has harmed you, anyone who has spoken evil against you, is in line to face this wrath. Therefore, as we come to the end of chapter 18, I think there's three main points of application that can just tie in everything that we've learned these last two weeks. Number one, very very simply, very easily seen here, let God avenge. Let God avenge. He's a much better avenger than you and I are. God will balance the scales at the end of time. Wrong will be punished. Right will win. Therefore, you can rest in him judging on your behalf. This is so practical. When you're wronged, when you're maligned, if you're falsely accused, you don't have to rise up and defend yourself. You can rest. God's got this. And he might not pay at the end of every day, but in the end he pays. He's got this. 
Application number two, I deserve this wrath. I deserve this wrath. I've spoken evil against my brothers and sisters. I have, in doing so, do you remember what Jesus said about the way that if we speak uh, with anger in our hearts towards our brothers and sisters, it's as if we are murdering them in our hearts. That means though these, these citizens of Babylon are actually killing the saints. I've murdered you in my heart if I've ever spoken in anger against you. I deserve this wrath. We are to worship God for his judgment. That presupposes there's wickedness that needs to be judged. And instead of pointing the finger at other people around you, let's let this text be a mirror to us, confronting our own anger, confronting our own materialism. If we blush at this judgment that God's going to bring, it's not because we're too compassionate. It's really because we're too wicked. We devalue what wickedness is. We don't understand it for what it truly is and its depravity. And if we do devalue wickedness, we'll never understand the beauty of the cross. I deserve this wrath. And yet it was poured out on my Savior. It was poured out on Jesus so that I don't have to fear any future wrath whatsoever. No condemnation because I'm in Jesus. That's why we love him. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you know that you are worthy to deserve this wrath. And yet God in his grace, God the Father poured out the wrath that you and I deserve on Jesus, his son, so that we would not have to fear an ounce of wrath, not one drop of wrath, but only glory. Adopted into the family of God, called sons and daughters, brought to his table, That's why we love him. And if you love him, you long to be with him. That's why we can let the entire worldly system go. Just like that old hymn says, take this world, but give me Jesus. I don't need any of this. I want Christ. This is why Paul says in Philippians chapter one, I desire to depart and be with Christ because that is very much better than what I'm experiencing here. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I think the world is the opposite. The world is to live is gain, get as much as you can, and to die something in the afterlife, who knows what. But for Christians, to live is all about Christ and death is gain because everything that I lose when I die in this life, put it all on one side of the scale and just put Jesus on the other side. And gaining him just throws all of those other possessions off the scale. Do you long for Jesus? Do you love Jesus? Do you long for eternity? I had an amazing conversation with my son. We got to go out on a little daddy-son date on Friday. And Ethan and I were talking about heaven. It was so, so awesome. And he said, Dad, you know what I'm going to miss about heaven? Because we were talking about the rain that's coming. It kind of looked like rain, smelled like rain. He said, you know what I'm going to miss about heaven? I'm going to miss the rain. I said, really, why? He said, I just, I love the way it looks. I love I love lightning. I love thunder. And he said this, which is totally like, this is, he's my son. He goes, I love the way it smells after it rains. I'm like, you got that from me. Come on, man. I love the way it smells after it rains. And so I said, well, son, the Bible doesn't say that rain isn't going to be happening in heaven. In fact, the Bible says there's a rainbow in heaven. So if there's a rainbow, maybe there's rain. He goes, oh, cool. He says, but I'm going to miss animals, dad. I'm going to miss animals in heaven. I said, actually, you know, the Bible says there's animals in heaven. Not our animals, not our pets. It's one of the most devastating things that kids learn, so I'm telling it to my kids now. If we ever have pets, pets don't have souls, so I don't think our pets are going to heaven. They don't die and go to heaven. But God knows we love our pets, so my guess is that God's going to give us either our pet or something better, and we're going to enjoy it. God knows what we love, and we know biblically there are animals in heaven. My son goes, cool. I didn't know that. Then he says, well, I'm going to miss dinosaurs. I said, wait, when have you ever seen a dinosaur here? Like, you can't miss it if you've never experienced it. He goes, no, I like dinosaur bones and, and, and books about dinosaurs. And I said, dude, you've never even seen a dinosaur. Guess what? I think in the new heavens and the new earth, I'm guessing there will be dinosaurs. He goes, there's going to be dinosaurs in heaven? Yes. So he says to me, man, dad, I guess I'm not going to miss anything when I go to heaven. I, I thought, number one, that's the coolest thing in the world for him to go, I just want to be there and I'm fine leaving everything else behind. 
And then I was able to tell him two things. I said, Ethan, you know there's going to be dinosaurs in heaven maybe, animals for sure, maybe rain, all these cool things. But that's not what makes heaven amazing. Take all those things away and give me Jesus. And I have everything I need to be satisfied. I just want him. And he said, yeah, Dad, I know. (laughs) Okay, thanks, Ethan. Ruining a moment, son. I said, Ethan, there is one thing that you will miss in heaven. And I don't even know how this works in heaven. And I said, Ethan, if there's somebody that you know in this life that you love and they don't know Jesus, they won't be with us in heaven. That's why you need to tell them. That's why you need to show them that Jesus is better than this life. That's why you need to be on mission now to tell people that Jesus is better than anything this life has to offer. We prayed. Where else but Chipotle? And I pray that not only my son, but all of us would collectively say, take the world, give me Jesus. Our response to divine judgment reveals who we really are and what we really prize. This tells us something about ourselves. Are we like the kings who weep because judgment has come? Or are we like all of heaven who rejoices because sin is going to be judged and we get to live in righteousness with Christ? Choose this day, as Joshua would say, whom you will serve. Is it God or is it this world and its riches? The hour is coming when God will judge and it's too late to make that decision. For now, you can choose, but there will be no ambivalence then. Father, we thank you so much for the stark reality of these two opposing reactions. All of Babylon mourns because what they love the most was taken away. And all of heaven rejoices because what they hate the most are sin and evil and wickedness and anything that takes us away from you is destroyed. Babylon mourns because what they hate the most, Jesus, the son of God, is coming back to rule and to reign and to destroy them. All of heaven rejoices because what they love the most, Jesus Christ, is ruling and reigning. And so, Father, all we can say in response to the the reality of what chapter 18 prophesies about the future and what that means for us today, all we can say and plead with a, a cry of our own hearts and a prayer to you is please be everything to us. Be everything to us. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Be our vision May we, may we sing that riches we heed not, nor man's empty praise. You are our inheritance both now and forever. Grow affections for Jesus Christ in our hearts, even as we sing. We pray in the name of Christ, our greatest treasure. Amen.